topic so excited um, that you are able to tune in. My name is Tyree Daniels. I am the founder and executive director of West of the Mirror. We are a healing justice social movement that provides mental health awareness and suicide prevention to communities of color through art, advocacy, and affirming care. And we do this with a focus on women, youth, and the LGBTQIA plus persons and communities. And today, and for the next, I guess, four months moving forward, since this is our second <laughs> webinar, West of the Mirror is partnering with the Black AIDS Institute to bring you sessions linking race, gender identity, HIV health, and mental health in a way that empowers us and moves us to advocate for one another and ourselves. So today I am joined by David, well, two David, <laughs> David Wally Long and David Coleman. And um, at this time, I will just give the floor to them to introduce themselves. Hello, everyone. I'm David Wally Long. I am a national community organizer with Black AIDS Institute. Um, although the Institute is based in Los Angeles, I reside in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you. Everybody. Oh, hey, David. Uh, I also work at the Black AIDS Institute. I, uh, my name is also David. Uh, so, you know, we'll work through that. And uh, I run programs here in LA for the local team for BAI. Nice to meet you all. So I guess, yeah, we'll get, we'll, we will get started. Uh, is the PowerPoint up? I can't see this up. Oh, here we go. Screen is being shared. Great. All right, so we are here to talk about gender, sex, and sexuality. Um, uh, what we discuss here today is just pretty much going to be an introduction to everything. So I invite you to ask many questions. We invite you to ask many questions to engage with us and, uh, and, and make sure that you are still hungry for more knowledge when you leave this presentation because there's lots and lots and lots and lots to learn. You never stop learning. Uh, we can go, and uh, just so y'all know, that is Marsha P. Johnson, um, LGBTQ icon on the first slide there. So do some research on her. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna start with some shared agreements, uh, just to make sure that we're creating an atmosphere of learning, reflection, and commitment. Uh, I want, the first one here is speak from your own, oh, am I, am I on mute? Oh, okay, no, no. Uh, speak from your own experience. Basically, just use I statements uh, when you're speaking. You're going to be talking about yourself, not anybody else, but yourself. So use the word I. Share the air. Uh, make sure that if you are talking a lot or you're asking a lot of questions, maybe step down. If you're not asking a lot of questions, not engaging, step up. We're going to make sure to share the space and that uh, everybody is heard. We're going to avoid making generalizations. You're going to consider your own position and power within this conversation. So uh, check your privilege. Uh, your camera should be on. Well, that doesn't really uh, apply here. Uh, 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 oh, curiosity over defensiveness. So uh, that basically means, again, ask questions, be open-minded to different perspectives, listen without judgment, be fully present, and don't fear being wrong. Uh, if the group does hear something that's a little off, uh, we will not necessarily call you out on it, but we will call you in on it. We will let you know with compassion, you know, what you said was, possibly wrong, and here's another way you can say it, um, with compassion, with, with love, we will call each other in using that. Uh, next slide, please. So our objectives, thank you, <laughs> go back, but thanks, David, thanks, David. So our, let's go through our objectives. We hope by the end of this conversation, we will all have learn how to define and describe gender, sex, and sexuality, and understand the difference in meaning. Additionally, we hope to understand how gender, sex, and sexuality might have different interactions with race and class. And then lastly, please, we hope that you learn how to describe strategies to create HIV prevention and care programs that acknowledge and address disparities caused by intersecting oppressions. And like as um, the greater David, as I like to call him, said, if you have any questions or thoughts, please do not hesitate to raise your hand or put it in the chat, all right? Because I definitely know it's a lot of information and we definitely don't want nothing to be lost um, in translation. So please feel free to utilize the chat um, effectively as well as just say, hey, I didn't get that, what happened? 
Next slide. So let's set the stage. Why do we need to talk about HIV and gender? There's a few ways that we can look at it. This chart above shows there are disparities in health outcomes for female people and male people. A care continuum tells us a little more about where people are in their HIV care experience. Before care continuums, we only spoke about diagnosis and mortalities. This helped us learn more about the path to viral, viral suppression and how to advocate resources. Remember, viral suppression is important because it helps the person living with HIV stay healthy, but also because undetectable means untransmittable. So recently, I don't know if you've heard or not, and I'm going to use what David said, I'm not going to just assume. Let me break that down even a little bit more. Undetectable means that the virus has been suppressed to the levels where it cannot be transferred to someone else. And that was very groundbreaking in the HIV community because that means that as someone, if I'm living with HIV, I cannot transmit it to someone else. It is how Magic Johnson has been living and thriving since 1993 after his diagnosis. And as we know, his wife, Cookie, has not had the virus, you know? So that's important. You know, once you suppress that virus and once you get that virus under um, certain labs do under 20 copies, some do under 50 copies, but we'll just say for this particular say, under 50 copies means there is less than 50 copies. There may be one or two HIV cells within the body. That means that even without, um, preventable measures, condom, for example, you cannot transmit the virus. And that is so important because if there's no one transmitting the virus to someone else, it decreases the rates of HIV. So this slide shows us two populations, males and female population. We can see in that alone, there are disparities in the health outcomes. But this slide also has some misnomers. When we're talking about male and female, we're actually talking about sex not gender. And if we really want to talk about gender, there has to be more categories. And if we really wanted to get into it, we have to talk about demographics, about race, age, and class as well. I know I said a lot, but there's a lot of example what I'm talking about. And I'll talk about it in the next slide. But as you see between the two, two slides, I want everyone to just fully understand that when someone receives the HIV diagnosis, that is the left. And then Linked to care means that after the positive diagnosis, they are linked to see a respective nurse practitioner or doctor to get them into care. Next is retain. So retains mean they have seen the doctors multiple times. So now the doctor is treating the HIV. Next is prescribed ART. ART is antiviral therapy, which is basically medicine to suppress the virus. And then finally, viral su suppression was that untransmittable diagnosis. So um, Tanisha, who is on the back end, she, um, we will have time to address questions. I just wanna make sure, yes, following the presentation, thank you. And Tanisha, who is our senior manager of training and capacity, I think I got it. She, we will get to those at the end. Thank you, Tanisha. Next slide. So the previous slide left out full gender demographics. And it seems within those demographics, transgender men and women, there's a lot to parse out on racial and ethnic lines. So we see that in order to talk about HIV in the United States, we really have to be able to talk about these different demographics, gender and racial markers. We're going to focus on gender today, but we'll talk about race and class a little bit later. And as you zero in and really look at, yes, these slides are seven years old, but the trends have remained consistent with these respective slides. And it's important to note that the CDC for the longest did not even include transgender population within their demographics. So if a trans identified person came into the clinic, they will lump them under um, categories that was not aligned on who they are um, claiming to be or respective of who they are. So just understanding that, imagine going into a doctor's office and you are self-identifying as something and they put something completely different down. If I go into the doctors and say, hey, I'm Michael and I identify as male and they put down female. 
is disrespectful, number one, but more importantly, it doesn't show the fullness of that person. And also data is not collected correctly. I just want to Next add, that, go ahead, David. I want to add quickly that the CDC still does not recognize trans women um, under uh, their own umbrella. They are they are lumped under uh, MSM, so they're lumped in the same categories as gay, bisexual, um, and men who have sex with men, which is absolutely wrong and transphobic. The CDC is transphobic. Just want to add that. Okay. All right. It, listen, Dave. The greater Dave is going to tell you the truth and nothing about it. I I, I feel that. So next slide. So we've seen different charts about health disparity. This is an HIV care continuum, and it shows how many people know their diagnosis are linked in retaining care and ultimately reach viral suppression. We know that viral suppression is the goal because it helps the person living with HIV remain healthy, but also because viral suppression means an undetectable viral load, which in turn means a virus is untransmittable. You can see the disparities in health outcomes here, starting even at diagnosis. We know that the differences are not due to be different. Excuse me, let me start over. We know that the differences are not due to differences in biology or behavior or among ethnic groups. Let's talk about specifically how racism shapes these health outcomes. As you can see from these statistics on the right, there is also an element of who is re related to gender and sexuality. We'll get to that in just a second. So as you see, Black Americans are 14%, just 14% of the population will make up about half of new HIV infections. Additionally, it is estimated that one in two Black gay men will acquire HIV in their lifetime. So, you know, if you know, let's say five same gender loving men, it is estimated that three out of those are HIV positive. It does not mean that, you know, three are right. However, it is very important how to understand how HIV impacts certain populations way more than other populations. Additionally, it is estimated that one in 48 Black women will acquire HIV in their lifetime compared to white women who have a one in 588% chance. That's a, like, you know, you think of, let's just take the lottery into context. You know, people play the lottery all the time, right? You know, I think it's one in 3.76 million of your chances of winning the Powerball. Imagine if the lottery was one out of two. It's really different and really stark. So just understanding how your race and how your gender and how everything plays into you may be a you may be contracting HIV is really really deep next slide all right so uh thank you David uh so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about sex and what sex actually is uh to just so to describe that we're going to talk about sex assigned at birth sex assigned at birth is a doctor assigned label given at birth based primarily on genitalia observed as well as chromosomal factors the term assigned at birth as opposed to biological sex is preferred because this accounts for the possibility that a doctor is making a decision for someone else and that this assignment may not align with how the person feels. Um, so again, this kind of means that we don't, or let me ask the question, is anybody in this room, when you, when you were born, did you uh, say out your mouth what you were and tell the doctor what to write down? No, right? Like we don't get to choose um, our sex that is something that's assigned to us and many times it's assigned uh, um, in, in the wrong way. So when we're talking about sex, we are mainly talking about genitalia and those chromosomal factors. So uh, next slide, please. So here we have the gender unicorn. And this basically just, uh, this is going to help us help explain sex assigned at birth versus gender versus sex and versus sexuality. If we're talking about sex assigned at birth, again, we're talking about uh, the characteristics that you're born with or develop, including genitalia, body shape, body hair, voice pitch, hormones, chromosomes, all those things, uh, but mainly focused on the genitalia. So as you can see uh, on the, the right side, the one that circled, it says sex assigned at birth, see the little chromosome over there, and then that same chromosome is uh, uh, by the uni gender unicorn's private part, I guess that's where uh, a unicorn's private part would be. Uh, 
So that's how you that's how you can figure out what sex is and kind of remember what sex is. Um, next slide, please. So then we're talking about gender. Gender is different because gender is a social construct based on societal labels decided by characteristics, phenotype, behaviors, and expected manners. Gender includes gender roles, which are expectations society and people have about behaviors, thoughts, and characteristics that go along with a person's assigned sex. So again, gender completely made up. We Someone down the line decided that boys wear blue and girls wear pink and boys are masculine and girls are feminine. And you know, the, the more that we, uh, we grow up in, in, in our lives, we're realizing that these things are very false and anybody can kind of be anything. Um, and we don't have to stick to the roles that uh, traditions have told us to stick to. Next slide. So we're gonna focus on three gender variations. There are many, 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 many gender variations, probably more than any of us could count, but we're just gonna focus on these three um, as an introduction. So we have, first we have cisgender, a person who identifies with the sex they were assigned with. Can somebody put in the chat what the prefix cis means? C-I-S, what would cis mean? Same, great, thank you, Quasia. Thank you, cis means same, right? So uh, uh, identify with the sex, my, gen my gender identifies with the sex I was assigned at birth. I'll speak for myself, a doctor assigned me as a male uh, and I, continue to identify as a male. So I am a cisgender male, right? Then we have transgender. Uh, if cis means same, trans might mean different or change. Transgender is a person whose gender identity does not match the sex they were assigned at birth. So this change can happen at any time. This, um, they, people can feel trans at any time. It can start very, very early. It can start very late, but they are identifying as something that is not what, um, what the doctor assigned them as. And then we have gender fluid. Gender fluid or non-binary or gender non-conforming. These are per people whose gender identity is not fixed and or shifts depending upon the situation. So sometimes people wake up and feel uh, more like they're on the, uh, uh, the fem female side. Sometimes they feel like they're more on the male side, sometimes between, sometimes neither. Sometimes people just don't feel like a gender because all the descriptions of the genders are made up and they don't feel like anything like that. So it's okay to also just choose not to have a gender at all. And we want to do our best to respect all genders and to give the option for people to choose and tell us what their gender, their gender is. Uh, let's see, just make sure. Uh, oh, and, and at the bottom it says, uh, being cisgender, transgender, or gender fluid is a gender identity, not a gender expression. So how you express your gender is a very different thing as well. Next slide. So we're talking about gender identity. Um, uh, we're going to, we, we've learned that gender is a binary, it's man or woman, but in society we have a different idea, we have different ideas about what that means. So for example, we might ascribe different clothing to men versus women, or uh, we've started to learn that gender is not binary though, it's a spectrum, kind of how we've just been talking about. Um, and that's why people talk about their pronouns. They'll say they are he, him, hers, uh, and, and they'll tell you this so you actually know how to identify uh, them instead of you just assuming how to identify them. And then if you see on the chart, you see gender identity has a little rainbow. The rainbow on the unicorn is a thought. So this is kind of in the mind, right? This is in the mind. We had sex that was the private parts. The uh, identity is in the mind. Next slide. And then we have the gender expression, right? So if gender identity is in the mind, Sex is in the private part. Gender expression is that little green, those little green dots around the unicorn. It's basically how I'm going to express my gender. So when we're talking about gender expression, we're, we're just talking about how you present to the world. Are you wearing clothing that's traditionally associated with one gender or another, accessories, makeup, um, things like that. Uh, like for me example, so again, I'll speak for myself. I'm a cisgender male, uh, but if sometimes I might wear a skirt. Does that mean I identify as a woman? No, I don't identify as a woman, but my gender expression that day might uh, be more on the feminine side. So again, all of these things can be here, there, and everywhere, and it's just up to us to figure out who we are and um, be more comfortable with that. Next slide. So then we have sexual orientation, and this is who you desire a relationship with and or who you're attracted to, right? So this word is made as resurgence, 
though, excuse me, the word queer has made a resurgence in the past couple of years. And a lot of folks are familiar with it more of a, a derogatory term and slur. But nowadays, certain spaces and people have reclaimed the term as a broad and inclusive celebration of human sexuality, um, sexual orientation, and gender. Going one step further, the term has been used, utilized by Black queer spaces um, as the LGBTQIA movement has historically been very white and omitted Black folks from participating. So again, se sexual orientation is who you desire a relationship with. And it's kind of also based on the gender that you identify with. So using myself as an example, if I'm a cisgender man that's a, that is attracted to uh, uh, men, then I might consider myself homosexual or gay, right? If I am a cisgender, if I'm a transgender man and I'm attracted to a woman, um, I would consider myself straight, right? Um, that is sexual orientation. Next slide. And then we have sexuality. Uh, and I know this might get very confusing, but sexual, sexual orientation is a little different from sexuality as sexual orientation, again, is who you love. Sexuality is how you do it, right? So there are various ways to love. Um, oh, I, oh, am I on the wrong slide? What is, oh, I don't have that slide. Sorry, y'all, a little technical difficulty. Oh, but I can see it. I can see it on your screen. Um, sorry, what is sexual orientation? The part of you expressed through your sexual activities and relationships. Oh, this explains um, just a little bit about the different sexual orientations. So we'll go through those really quickly. Excuse me, sorry, y'all. Uh, so we have heterosexual there, attraction to people of the opposite sex, as we discussed. Homosexual, attracted to people of the same sex. Bisexual, attraction to both male and female gender identities asexual, the absence of sexual attraction. So some people don't feel sexual attraction um, and they, they might consider themselves asexual. Pansexual, attraction to multiple gender identities. Questioning is unsure or exploring. And again, thousands and thousands and thousands of different sexual orientations. We're finding out new ones every day. Um, our job is to just learn as much as we can, uh, little by little, not to overwhelm ourselves, but just to always stay cognizant that the world is moving and changing and there are always things to learn. Next slide. Okay, I have this slide. Sexuality. Yes, this is what I was just about to talk about. So this is, again, the personal preference on how you love. Um, this term can be often interchangeable with sexual orientation, but it doesn't mean the same thing because sexuality operates very separately. So sexuality can be more so, again, how you're having sex. So like, do or, or how you're attracted to people or how you love. So if you're a very, very sexual person, right, that might be called hypersexuality, right, versus someone that doesn't want to have sex a lot or is like not attracted or have sexual feelings, and that might be a uh, asexual person. Or you'll have, um, uh, if, you're, if you are in a relationship with one person and you always want to love one person, you might be a monogamous person versus someone that uh, has multiple relationships with different people with consent, hopefully, uh, that you might be polyamorous, right? So there are different ways to love other people, to have sex with other people, and that would be sexuality. Next slide. Uh, just to note, the terms transgender, cisgender, and gender nonconforming include multiple identifying factors, sex assigned at birth, gender identity. Uh, they have no indication of sexuality or sexual orientation. So all the things that we went over are very separate things, and we all, we, and I think it would be best if you all kind of figure out what those things are for yourself, um, and uh, doing so will help you understand um, how other people might struggle uh, with doing the same thing. Next slide. So thanks, David. So it is very important to understand that a lot of this information is heavy. So just processing it in and, you know, just understanding that it is a lot, you know, we did this presentation a while back and someone was like, oh my God, I didn't understand that, what have you. So just take it all in at your own pace and what have you. So now let's just talk about HIV and gender. How folks define patriarchy, implicit bias and misogyny as facilitator brings them up. Think about how we talk about the history of the HIV epidemic. We often highlight how the men who were impacted but for good reason. I mean, if you look at the origin of the actual virus, the actual virus was called something completely different when it was first diagnosed June 5th, 1981. It was GRID. 
which was a gay man's infectious disease, all right? So just understanding the evolution has progressed where now it is, of course, the human efficiency immune deficiency virus. It is not centered just to one population, one gender, what have you. So just understanding that, that it took a while to understand that. And that is why that many times it is centered around one um, person, but now obviously it is a human illness and what have you. So I just really wanted people to, because a lot of times people say, why is that so? Well, the very beginning, the first diagnosis and what have you, that's where it was centered and what have you. Um, at Black AIDS Institute, we, also, we often hear how anecdotes, how women who are long-term relationships may not even be offered an HIV test because of biases, bias, excuse me, their providers hold. We made this flyer to counteract that. We also think how many policies may impact which health services women can access. We recognize and we uplift our Black women. Black lives matter. Knowing your status and getting individuals that are high risk for sexual health on PrEP, what have you. Those implicit bias only prevent individuals from getting tested as well as getting access to education, treatment, prevention, and care. Next slide. So consider those first two charts that you first saw. The first care continuum show us in detail about only two genders, but the in-depth look at the trans community show how much more understanding is necessary. As David just alluded to with the, the unicorn, it is very impactful in understanding how identity plays a critical role in treating the HIV epidemic. Gender-based bi bias, I always have a tough time, excuse me, um, creates an environment where the HIV epidemic continues to thrive. Those who fall out of traditional gender identities face further discrimination. And then finally, as David too alluded earlier, lack of data for the trans and non-binary people means a lack of resources for those community as well. If you don't have, you know, appropriate support to make people feel the fullness of themselves, how can you adequately treat them? Next slide. So, Let's talk about medical care and gender identity. In order to remedy the disparities in quality of care and combat medical mistrust, a relationship and eventually legacy of trust must be developed. If I'm going into a doctor's office, every single thing matters. Every single thing from the moment I walk in to the respective place. Um, Additionally, we must work to redress power imbalances and work to create mutual beneficial relationships with clients and approach treatment from a perspective that employs cultural humility and cultural competency. Next slide. So the intersexuality. Intersexuality is very important because it talks about the simultaneous experience of care and hierarchical classifications. The great Audre Lorde says so poignantly that there is no single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. I just wanna just really seep in that. I'm gonna just really sit in that. There is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So just understanding when someone sees you and someone walk in, they don't see just one part of you. They see many things of you. You're just not a man. You know, they identify you as your race. You may be, as David explained earlier, they may identify you because of what you're wearing or what have you. So understanding how those intersectionalities play a acute role in addressing the HIV epidemic. So to recap, why are we starting off a review on race and class as we go into the webinar about gender, sex, and sexuality? Because when it comes to HIV work, there are no separating these factors. They all play into each other. Do we have questions before we get into gender, sex, and sexuality bit? So 
as Tanisha alluded to earlier, we will get to keep those questions coming and we will get to other questions at the end. All right. Next slide. Great. Uh, so, yeah, so David had just started uh, talking about HIV work <clears throat> and what it is. Um, and uh, this is just more on that. HIV work is anti xenophobic, it's anti sexist, it is anti homophobic, it's anti transphobic, it is not stigmatizing. If your HIV work is any of these things, it ain't HIV work. I don't know who you're working for, but it, it, ain't, it ain't to uh, uh, get rid of this, this virus. So those of us who do know the work, we know that's not as just simple as doing a blood draw, it's or reading results or giving a presentation to a group of people. Um, HIV work means looking beyond those numbers and statistics and understanding the experiences of our clients and the people that we serve. Sometimes this goes beyond being just an active listener. It takes action on a personal, organizational and community level to do so. Next slide, please. So how does gender affect your work? So this is just an example um, that we'll talk about. Upon entering a clinic, a client asks to fill out forms prior to being administered a test. The care specialist asks whether the client is male or female, and the client does not identify as either. For fear of being stigmatized and mistreated, the client feels obligated to choose from the options presented, leading to an incomplete and inaccurate medical history assessment. So as we can see here, uh, this client came in you know, looking for services, they're immediately triggered by a, uh, by a doctor or a specialist asking them, giving, not giving them a choice of gender, but asking which one they wanted to choose. They choose one that they don't identify with. And now not only are, is the data going to be messed up, but that client's gonna be sitting there, you know, slightly traumatized the whole time. Are they going to want to work with you? Are they going to want to continue um, coming to your office, getting those services? Maybe, but maybe not as much. They're going to be a little hesitant because you've already started the conversation off wrong. Uh, second, uh, next slide. How does sexuality affect your work? A straight presenting woman arrives at a clinic in order to take an HIV test. The tester proceeds to ask her about her medical history. And upon mentioning her sexual partners, the tester assumptively uses male gender pronouns to describe them. So, um, so in this situation, I'm, I'm an HIV tester as well. Um, we don't know who people are having sex with. And it and in and, and giving counseling for that, depending on who they are having sex with, that's a very different conversation. So if I assume that a woman is having sex with a man because of heteronormativity, then I'm really leaving out a huge, huge, huge um, opportunity to address issues that I haven't even asked about. So again, we want to ask people uh, um, what their sexual orientation is. We wanna ask them what their partners are and, and not assume. Next slide. So how do race, class, and gender affect your work? Your client is a black trans woman. You've enlisted her as a gatekeeper to bring condoms information to people in your network. She tells you that the last time she left your office, she was stopped and frisked by the police who found the condoms you gave her in her purse. They asked her questions, suspecting she was a sex worker. She wasn't arrested, but she remained shaken by the experience. Uh, so again, all of these factors really, really do affect your work. <clears throat> and, and not even just inside your job, but outside your job, your neighborhood, the things that are going on um, in and outside of your job affect your clients. If you have heavy policing by your agencies, by where you work, that's something that needs to be discussed with, uh, with your agency and with the, the community, because we want, again, people to feel very comfortable um, in, uh, with, with our agencies. Next slide. So just to close that out, HIV is a feminist issue, it's a queer issue, it's a racial justice issue, it's a health issue. It's an intersectional issue, so our programs must be intersectional. We really do have to learn how to see people for more than just one thing. We come in a variety of, of, uh, of colors and uh, we need to start using that crayon box just a little bit more. Next slide, please. Thank you, David. So this slide is very poignant because it really shows how we are working through equity and liberation within America. So on the left shows equality. Um, equality is something that is we are striving for, obviously in black and white America, but more importantly, just the importance of it. On the far left, you will see how someone is able to see a baseball game with full visibility, with no problems, what have you. The middle child is 
barely able to see, you know, they're, they're, they're squinching over, but they're still able to see what have you. And then the last individual sees nothing. They see her wall. They're only able to see the sights and the sounds of the game. So as you can imagine, equality does not mean the same for all. One is striving to get over the one. One is getting the full visual um, display of the game and one is barely. Equ um, equity shows how everyone, everyone can see the respective game. However, they are seen at different levels in the regard of what they have to do in regard. Um, the reality is stark. That a reality shows how one race is far above and can see from a skyscraper level um, the, the height of the game. The next is barely able to see what is happening in the game. And then the last one is barely even hearing a whisper of the game. So it's important to understand as we fight within Black AIDS Institute to have um, equity for all, the reality remains the same for many um, marginalized communities that fight to um, have equal representation. So um, I do, I know, I don't wanna be dismissive of Tanisha, but I definitely want in the chat, in the chat, just for a quick second, just make sure everyone's paying attention. What is liberation? What is liberation? So just a couple, and I'm gonna read a couple off the chat. What is liberation for you? After you see in that slide, what is liberation? And I'll read a couple of them. Um, while we wait on, let me see, um, some people to respond. I'm gonna put David, the greater David on the spot. David, what is li um, liberation for you? Hmm, what is liberation? I feel like I'm supposed to have a really good answer for this. Um, <laughs> no, give it to me honestly. I just wanna see my people free. Like, I just wanna see my people okay. out here and doing the things they wanna do, you know? Right. Like, living okay. their ancestors. I don't know about everybody else. I'm, that's what I want for my people. <laughs> awesome. So a couple of people, and thank you for the people. Um, I have Ms. Collins said complete freedom. Um, Merrick Moses said liberation is no wall at all, no boxes too. Um, Dana, thank you. Freedom through equity. Um, someone Donald said removal of barriers, removing barriers. Also, Abby mentioned Amelia Rose said equity. Um, Marcus McPherson down in Mississippi. Good to see you, Marcus. To me, liberation is being completely and unabashedly free from oppression and barriers to your own happiness and sense of self. Additionally, Sarah Johnson said freedom. Paul thought the liberation is being on the other side, sitting in the stands. All right, Paul, give us a different view. So his liberation is being on the other side. You're not even behind the wall. You sitting in the stands or what have you. I feel it. Um, Julia said, living, loving, and being without restriction or judgment, and then reparation. All right, Kramita, I see you bouncing over. Kramita is one of our B10 leaders down in Miami. Thank you for supporting our efforts. So next slide. So it is basically what Paul alluded to earlier, no walls, no no big areas and what have you. We all are different. That is important to recognize within this slide. We cannot change who we are. You know, we all can definitely see the game, but just recognize our differences do not exclude us or make us any different, but just recognizing that we all are different, but we all should be um, given the same opportunities, the same different um, chances as everyone else. And that is liberation through the Black AIDS Institute, just equality for all. Thank you everyone for submitting their thoughts on liberation. Next slide. So culture humility and culture competency. That is so important because culture com competency is the recognition that providers must be aware must be aware of the different culture and social norms in order to best serve a community. Additionally, cultural humility is a reminder to be constantly introspective and working to improve and learn more. The key attribute here is it is a constant evolution of learning. You are, should always be learning how to be greater, how to be um, understanding of who you are and what have you. That is so important. If you are not aware 
and woke as the, the kids and the millennials will say, what have you, what purpose are you doing to help further the cause? What are you doing constructively to make sure that every single thing is being done? Next slide. Thank you, Tanisha, for that. So how do you do that? You make the space warm. Um, warm. Um, very simple. Um, welcome in is to teach the security how to be respectful about gender pronouns identification. And then also even a tech step further. Somebody may not have an ID. Don't question it. Obviously, there are rules and regulations, what have you. How do you get around that? How do you make someone feel welcome into your respective office, what have you? If they don't have an ID, what other metrics can they do so they can receive adequate care? Next is create intake forms that allow clients to self-identify around race and gender. Imagine you fill out something and you don't see Black on there. What you going to do? You know, you can't. Um, you know, obviously other is a box, but you could just shift that by just putting a blank space. That way you are letting the person feel the fullness of them in how they self um, identify. And then finally, if possible, after offer snacks and water, as well as a cup of coffee. Sometimes it is very the small things in order to make sure people feel good about themselves and also welcoming. Next slide. So how do you act in solidarity? Community members or CAVs, which is community advisory boards, can help you create an advocacy and policy plan. You need everyone at the respective table in order to improve outcomes. Not one person has the answer. Many people have many different thoughts. So just recognizing everyone in the community should have a say and to improve in the lives of everyone in the community. Again, institutional advocacy is important. Work, the service, work to make services more accessible. And then finally, empower people to advocate for themselves, even if it forces you to look at your own policy. Self-efficacy is probably one of the most powerful tools within this work. And if a person feels you know, powerful enough to speak up on their behalf or what have you, just imagine what the outcomes can be. Next slide. I think that was, was that, was that the final slide? All right, so I think that was the final slide. And um, David, you wanna take the first question? Um, sure, so I think there was a question in the chat earlier. Oh, here it is, question one. She's gonna put them in order probably. Okay, bet. Um, so why is it transgender instead of transgendered? So, uh, so when we're talking about uh, being transgender, the, the, the title is just transgender. Um, identities don't have a uh, past tense to them. So would you see that ED at, at the back of any identity? It appears as if something happened to you. So think about it like, um, it, it's almost like you were transgendered. Like, oh, and then that thing happened to you when people are born being transgender, it didn't happen. It just always was. If you think about it, um, uh, there's black folks in here, right? So like, think about being black, like, am I blacked? Did like black happen to me? No, like I just, I'm just black, that's just it. Um, so that's an easy way to kind of remember that. And it's a very, um, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big, uh, it's a mistake that many people make, um, adding the ED at the back of it, but it's, um, it, can, it can come off as a little disrespectful when you do that. And then. I wanted to add to that too, um, if you didn't mind. So along with transgendered, we want to expunge a transgender from our vocabulary and refer to people just as transgender. And right. when we're also referring to people as transgendered, it puts an unnecessary focus on like the physical um, sort of transformation that sometimes people are like hyper-focused on. Um, as we know, transgender people don't have to physically transition to be transgender. And it also erases the people who can't do that um, for reasons of access or even reasons of safety. So um, just adding to David's brilliant explanation. Look, you just made it more brilliant. Thank you. Um, uh, absolutely, absolutely right. And then question two is how you love the same as who you love. Uh, so again, um, Oh, and if there are more questions about uh, the transgender dirt thing, please uh, uh, put in the chat. Um, uh, the, uh, sorry, I lost the question. Oh, how you love versus who you love. So again, how you love 
um, excuse me, who you love is based on the person, right? So if uh, we're talking about uh, being homosexual, heterosexual, uh, polysexual, who I love, right? I'm a man, who do I, as a man, what genders do I love, right? Um, and then how you love is how you do it. Um, you can even think about it as simple as like, are you a romantic person? Do you like to go out on dates? Do you like to wine and dine someone? That is part of your sexuality. That's how you love. Or are you the type of person that you wanna see, you wanna see a man like every week, once a week, maybe once every two weeks, cause you two, you're independent, you ain't gotta see him. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's your sexuality too. It, it just depends on how you love and those things um, can fall in many different categories. Hopefully that explains it. And then the charts, uh, are charts available to email to attendees? I believe we could get those to you. Um, and then there's yeah. some questions in the, oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. But yes, David, yeah, we will be able to get those um, slides to everyone. Um, thanks for everyone. And, and thanks for those questions and answers. I was thinking the same thing when you were saying about how you love versus who you love, like polyamorous, you know, uh, like, you know, just being in relation with one person at the same time. All of those are different ways. So um, I never thought about that question until we, we brought it up um, today. Um, also, if you could, um, the greater David, <laughs> David COVID, if you guys could put your um, information in the chat box, we have a lot of requests, but we're going to move on to the question and answer box. So we got a, um, two of them over here. Um, and so I guess I would give it to the first one to um, uh, David uh, Wiley Long. The first question was, what was how, what has by determined the contributing factors to be as it relates to the rate acquirability between black and white? Or either one so, of you guys can answer that question. No, so uh, yeah. So you're talking about Miss Rose question or yes. Amelia Rose? Amelia Rose question, uh-huh. What has Black AIDS Institute determined the contributing oh, okay. factors to be related to as it relates to rate equality? So I think um, systematic. It's a lot of systematic um, oppression. Um, recently, I think I want to say the president mentioned that racism is a healthcare issue. Um, please uh, forgive me if I misquoted or who, if it was a CDC. I know that was recently in the news where a lot of this stuff, the systematic oppression has had huge result of why it is so. Because if you just look at getting access, healthcare access, and if you look at the different variations of why the actual access is um, largely in tail of getting better healthcare access, it is systematic barriers and what have you. And at Black AIDS Institute, we created a comprehensive report called We the People Report. So if you email me or David L, it's literally just a letter, David L, or David C at blackaids.org, we can get along with those slides, the We the People report. And that goes over what has happened, but how do we have solutions? We are very about solutions. We know what is wrong. We know, we've known, we black, we know that these systems of oppressions have um, prevailed us and has been there for so long. So what are we gonna do about it? Because although we could talk about stigma, we could talk about all of these factors, what are we doing to make sure that it does not happen? So this comprehensive We the People report entails four pillars where looks at how we can overcome those challenges and get to an age-free um, HIV community within Black and Brown community. Great question. Yes, and thank you. Great, great answer. And just to um, piggyback on that, the CDC and the American Public Health Association both determined racism as a public health crisis. So yes, that's <laughs> the information is right there. That statement of law, right? <laughs> so we had another um, question from Amelia Rose and thank you for correcting me with the BAI because I was like, I, <laughs> so has BAI, Black Ace Institute, consider securing funding to have updated research findings in order to have updated charts? Uh, so, oh, go ahead, David. I don't say, um, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe, do you know David? I think. I yeah, mean, so David's in LA. 
um, I'm in Tennessee, the charts that we have definitely, they do, they update it all the time. We just are using that because it shows the continuing trends. So every year, each state and federally, they're supposed to update. Now it is 20, June 21. It usually comes out in the middle of the year from the previous year. So you don't find out about 20 until right around now. Usually by the 4th of July, all the statistical data from 20 will be released because they have to crunch all the numbers. It's not like it comes out January 2nd and would have used this mid of the year where that information comes out. And then we look at it and what have you. So there is updated data and what have you. And obviously it is not necessarily, it's a more of a government thing where we don't have the revenue to go in and crunch state by state, federal and what have you. But we have seen huge decreases. However, those systems that are in place they continue to remain. And as Dr. Burns had just uh, alluded to, it takes a community effort. It is not David or Maya or even uh, myself here. It is literally everyone reducing stigma, everyone learning about this. You are doing it. You're doing the work now. Um, Tariq is leading this. You know, the more people know, the more ignorance goes away. The more educated people are know and say, oh, well, now I understand the greater outcomes are have. So it is the small steps in order to get to the bigger goal. So definitely recognize you're part of this movement by just being present. And we thank you for that. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. So we have one more question that we will do here in this presentation. But um, feel free to keep the questions coming. Um, we do have people in the background that will be able to answer these questions and get the um, information to you. But this will be the last question for us today um, by Donald Birch. Is there a difference between being a male and being a man? Uh, no, there's no difference between the two. But I, I believe, um, and David, please correct me if I'm wrong, when we're talking about um, people, we're usually talking about men and women. Um, male and female are very science-y terms um, and, uh, and tend to be, at least uh, if you're on Twitter and places like that, when people tend to use male and female, they're usually talking about something negative about that gender or sex, um, especially when we're talking about female, like females, right? Uh, females do this, females do that. So I think just, uh, um, I mean, you're not even, even really asking about that, but it just brings up a point. So just be careful how we are talking about people. We're talking about people, usually just using men or women is, is the right way to go. If we're talking about animals, maybe male or female. And if I could just say one quick thought, um, we have a BTAN, which um, I am charged with over 13 chapters across America. Kevin Johnson does the exact same work. He has 13 different regions, as I allude to, Cremita Gross is down in Miami-Dade, California. <clears throat> Florida, Miami Day, Florida. Please, please, if you would like to be engaged and definitely be a part of Black Ace Institute movement in whatever capacity, someone just talked about stigma, I lead our stigma reduction efforts, what have you. Please, please, we impair you to email us. We recognize that we need soldiers that want to be educated, that is out in the field and what have you. So please feel free to email us. We will connect you with our respective chapters, but also we would definitely have this conversation in whatever modality that you deem important. During this pandemic, we have opened the doors and we're able to get into a many different spaces and what have you. So just understanding the silver lining of the pandemic, we're able to broaden the scope. So please email David and I so we can continue this conversation and continue to educate and get to an age-free diagnosis, age-free America and Black and Brown communities. Yes, yes. Thank you, David, for that answer. And thank to both of the Davids, David Coleman and David Wiley Long for your presentation today. It was amazing. Um, you guys have the information in the chat box, so hopefully everyone um, got the information and those who will get the slides, the information is on the slide, so you can definitely contact again i'm tyree daniels um we will have this again next month so every third thursday we will continue our power series so make sure you follow us at westinamira.org on our social media platforms on facebook instagram and twitter at west of the mirror to find more information about this series but again every third thursday so next month will be another presentation around another topic so thank you guys for joining us and y'all have a great day wonderful <laughs>